Well, it's an honor and pleasure to be here uh, and to share with you how I've spent the last 30 years doing research. People often ask me how we got into this and how I started doing it, and I usually tell them a momentary lapse of reason. But the, uh, uh, I had a somewhat circuitous route into this. I was a construction worker before medical school. And then uh, I, after medical school, I actually initially went into surgery and then due to a number of reasons, went to internal medicine, got, kind of got bored with that, went back to um, cardiology and now it went back to a kind of surgery again. But I kept getting uh, sent patients with syncope. And um, this is defined as the transient loss of consciousness with spontaneous re recovery. English is a funny language. I mean, in English, we tend to use Greek and Latin terms to sound a little more erudite. Other, other languages just use the same term, like feigning. Uh, but it's from this Greek root that means to cut short. And it's a common problem. There are about 300,000 ER visits per year, about 75 to 100,000 hospital admissions. And it's a major issue. And um, initially, they were sent thinking they had some kind of heart rhythm disturbance or things like that. And we found they did not. And I became interested, like, what is going on with these people? And it turned out it was very evident they were getting periods of low blood pressure, uh, low heart rate and all, with nothing wrong with the heart. And so we began to realize it was f somewhat through the autonomic nervous system, but at the same time we realized we knew, knew very little about that. We didn't know how the brain was regulating this. We didn't know how it was controlling it. And so I began to look more and more at that. And uh, again, the, um, you can think of the autonomic system and the human nervous system in a variety of different ways. One way is to break it down into central and peripheral, and the peripheral can be broken down into um, somatic, the part you have control over, and autonomic, the part you don't. And the somatic nerves are different uh, than, the, uh, than the autonomic nerves. The somatic nerves are a linear system. They are a, a one plus one equals two system. You have one, nerve, one cell in the brain that has one nerve that goes to one muscle. That's why a neurologist with a stroke can trace back to the exact part of the brain where it occurred by just looking at what muscle deficit you have. However, while this is very effective for the somatic system, it is totally inadequate for the autonomic system because your autonomic system has a hundredfold more to do at any one moment. Even if you're perfectly motionless in bed and not using your somatic system at all, you still have to breathe, your heart still has to beat, you have to maintain your body temperature, etc. So there's not enough room in your, in, for a system that's linear to do that. It would be like having every outlet in your home have a different wire coming off the electric pole. So what we have in our bodies is what we've learned to do within our own homes and machines, which is have junction boxes. And these junction boxes um, are places where the, the, the cell in the brain sends out a nerve, it goes to this junction point, and off of that ganglia or junction point can come 20, 30, 40, or 50 nerves that go to 20, 30, 40, or 50 places. So literally one plus one equals 50. And that allows for very small amounts of neural tissue to control very large numbers of functions simultaneously. It also means though if something goes wrong, a lot will go wrong simultaneously. Now the parts of the brain, and I've colored them here, that are involved in this uh, process here um, are relatively small compared to the somatic system, which is all colored in blue here. And ascending information is processed in an area called the nucleus tractus tract solitaris. It's related to what's called the ventral lateral nucleus. And ultimately, the major command center is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus itself is broken into a number of sub groups called nuclei uh, that each control the different things, but our concepts of neural function are in the midst of a dramatic change because of the fact that previously we evaluated neural function by, by looking at what happened during strokes or purposely causing a stroke in an animal or causing damage to an animal and look at what function was lost. We now have the technology to do functional brain mapping with functional MRIs in pets. And it turns out that unlike what we thought before, where we thought had this very simplistic thing like this part of the brain does this, it turns out for most functions, multiple areas of the brain have to work together to do it. And they're relaying information back and forth. It's a much more complex thing. The American Academy of Neurology recently issued a functional brain map, which looks very different than in the past. Now, the areas that we discovered are part of that process, but they're only part of a very complex system. So these areas possibly intercommunicate with each other in a way that we don't begin to understand. However, uh, the medial preoptic nucleus, the one here, seems to be the one most involved in heart rate and blood pressure regulation. Now, there are multiple other levels that, that I go into when I'm talking to neurologists and things, but again, it's not a simple thing. This is a very complex, interactive system that is developed over, over hundreds of millions of years. And what does it do? It controls heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, bowel motility, skin turgor, sweating, 
all simultaneously and using similar mechanisms. Now traditionally we have broken this down into two components, sympathetic, that's the fight or flight part, and parasympathetic, the rest and digest part. Traditionally we have said that um, these areas, um, the sympathetic uses um, acetylcho I mean, uh, norepinephrine to work, the parasympathetic uses acetylcholine to work, and then the ganglia both use acetylcholine. And that was all well and good until the mid-1980s when Dr. Jeffrey Bernstock at the University of London, looking at the autonomic innervation of the intestines, showed that the same nerves can contain both acetylcholine and norepinephrine and nitric oxide. So what does that do to our cute little system? It kind of trashes it. Um, and indeed, we know that this is not quite adequate, but we have not come up with a new model yet. And so we continue to use the same, the same thing. In addition, a number of other neurotransmitters have been identified that are subtransmitters that, can, that are very important in regulating autonomic function that we do, not, we do not know how to integrate into a coherent system yet. You know, so we know they're there, we know uh, that we need to change it, we just don't know how to do that yet. Now using the traditional system, whatever one does, the other does the opposite. So your sympathetic system will speed your heart rate up, it'll, it'll raise your blood pressure, but it'll slow down your digestion. You, if you're an animal running away from a threat, you don't want to be spending energy digesting food. The parasympathetic system, called the rest and digest system, does the opposite. It lowers pressure, lowers heart rate, enhances bowel motility. How does your brain knows what go, know what is going on? It does so by looking at what are called mechanoreceptors that are unmyelinated C fibers. And when these are stretched, they give off more electrical activity. And what your brain is actually monitoring is the electrical output from these areas. And so um, the majority of these are in the posterior aspects of the right and left ventricle of the heart. So your heart's your major blood pressure sensor. Um, they're also through every vessel in the body, and, when, and again, your, this input is going constantly to your brain. Your brain is processing the information, sending out commands to make some kind of change, and then there's a feedback loop that says that it's done. It's a, just like the machines that we build today. Um, the, um, this is a, a map of the, this is a somewhat simplified map. Um, one of uh, my um, uh, daughter's ex-fiance was a... <laughs> system was a Cisco systems designer you know, with computer systems. When I showed this to him, he was shocked. He said, this is how we're designing artificial intelligence systems. This is exactly what we're doing, these overlapping redundant cross-sectional areas to begin to teach machines how to think. And he actually took a copy of this back to work with him um, to show other people. So we are duplicating what nature already figured out how to do. Uh, which is make these sort of complex interactive systems. But you can see that everything is connected to everything else. This system must work as a unit. You can change nothing without changing everything. And a change anywhere affects everything. It is a very different way of thinking. One of the side things I get into is medicine has its feet firmly stuck in the 19th century as far as looking at how things work. We are still stuck in this idea of reductionism, which is how all sciences begin, but then you quickly realize that reductionism only takes you so far and you need to look at different things. So in physics, Newtonian physics works as long as you don't want to do anything complicated. If you want to do, look at the universe, if you want to look at molecular activity, it falls apart, it doesn't work. And the physics people had to then develop quantum theory and relativity theory to look at it. Chemistry soon followed, biology followed, they abandoned reductionism. They said, well, it's nice to know what photosynth how photosynthesis works, but it doesn't tell you how a forest works. It doesn't tell you how a coral reef works. That's a whole idea of ecology. And only medicine is stuck in this reductionist mode. Now, when you, to give you an idea of what happens, when you stand, gravity will almost immediately displace downward roughly one-third of your body's blood volume. That's anywhere between 500 and 1,000 cc's, depending on the size of you. And when that displacement occurs, um, you, everybody would pass out unless you had a mechanism in place to, tell it, to correct for it. How does your body know what's happened? Well, there's suddenly a dramatic increase in the amount of stretch on the vasculature here and a decrease in the stretch up here. And so the mechanoreceptor firing rate goes up here and goes down here. Then the brain will increase sympathetic output to increase heart rate, increase the force of myocardial contraction, and to nearly triple vascular resistance. The blood vessels go like that and push blood upward, and it does it like that. So you can jump out of bed, jump out of a chair, do double back flips, and your pressure will stay exactly the same. They've actually measured gymnasts who are twisting and turning and flying through the air. Their pressure never changes. That's why they can do that. Um, 
Now, if that system fails, then blood will drain downward. Most of it is actually the largest vascular bed in your body is the mesenteric vasculature, that which in, in, uh, innervates the intestines. Because digesting food is the most energy consuming thing that you do. It takes one third of all your energy. To power that process and to absorb nutrients afterward, you have the most extensive blood uh, vasculature in your entire body. When you go into septic shock and your pressure drops to zero, where does all that blood go? It doesn't go to the legs. I mean, you've got that much room in your legs. It goes into your mesenteric vasculature, and studies have, done, have shown that doing labeling of it with radioactive tracers and looking at where blood goes, both in POTS and in sepsis and things like that. So the, increase, so the increase in vascular resistance pushes blood upwards, and if it fails, blood will drain downward. Now many of these people are, the uh, backup system that we have as humans, humans are the only truly two-legged creatures on the planet. Monkeys can walk a little bit, but they don't like it. They usually go on all fours. And that adaptation produced a great degree of freedom because it freed up our hands. It allowed us to run. We're the only creatures that can run for long periods of time. One of the ways that primitive people, it turns out, hunted is they just chased animals till they dropped over and then stabbed them to death. I mean, that's what we did. And they would overheat, and we don't have any hair all over us so that, that creatures would overheat, fall over, and traditionally, even in the Serengeti plains and things like that, that's how, that's how those tribal people still hunt. So to keep our, but the trouble is when you run, you've got this problem because you want to relax arteries and to allow more blood and oxygen to get to the act actively metabolizing muscle, but at the same time, that would drop your pressure. So we've evolved this thing that's uniquely human called the skeletal muscle pump. Other animals don't have it because they don't need it. Um, and when you contract your leg muscles and to a lesser extent your abdominal and arm muscles, it compresses the venous system and propels blood back to your heart. And a healthy set of legs can raise your pressure 10 points or more. So this mechanism is there usually during heavy exercise, but many people with poor autonomic tone will use it all the time unconsciously. Um, in the mid-1980s, Dr. Uh, Richard Sutton and Dr. Rose Kenny at the Westminster Hospital in London had the idea that if you inhibit the skeletal muscle pump, you could provoke periods of autonomic decompensation. And they used a ta tilt table with a footboard made for weight bearing and just tilted people to an incline of 60 degrees. At this angle, the only stress upon you is gravity. That should be no problem. I myself, in the early days, stood there for three hours just you know, to see what, what uh, we did, a bunch of studies looking at what a normal person's time they could stand is. I mean, when you do, you know, some of the surgeries I do are five and six hours long wearing a 30-pound a lead apron. Um, you know, so, I mean, it's, these are not unusual stresses that people put themselves through. Um, how many people stand all day when they work at, at counters or at security areas or whatever? So this should not be a problem if you have a normal system. But if you don't, you will provoke, the system will not be able to handle it without your skeletal muscle pump and blood will drain downward and you'll precipitate an event. Now, why was this good? It, it provided us with a diagnostic medium, but I think the more important thing is it allowed us a way to provoke episodes of decompensation when we wanted to so we could measure what was happening. So we could do, electro, we could do electroencephalograms, we could do echocardiograms, we could do abdominal and, and thoracic impedance studies, we could draw blood for all kinds of things, we could measure pressures directly, we could do sympathetic nerve traffic recordings. We could do everything and we could do it when we wanted and record it as it was happening. This is the second patient we ever did. The first patient was negative. Um, I had actually been and listened to Dr. Sutton's presentation in Europe uh, in 1987, um, and then came back and started and said, that's pretty cool, let's see if we can do it here. This is a woman who was a nurse who was fired from her local hospital because she kept passing out. Um, and she had the billion dollar test circa 1988, which is when this is from. Uh, and they, she was told what we tell everybody when we don't know what's wrong, you must be crazy. Um, and, and this was still a research test at the time, and so you can see a few minutes into the, not very long into the test, she felt, said, oh God, I don't feel well, I think I'm going to, and then she never finished the sentence, and you can see her blood pressure and heart rate go to zero, and at this point she lost consciousness, she was incontinent, she urinated all over herself, she started having seizure activity, and my nurse and I stood there going, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> So we figured we better put her down. Um, and you can see that her pressure rebounds and now becomes hypertensive. 
So if you're anybody who knows anything about diabetes knows that if a diabetic, their blood sugars drop to zero quickly, their liver puts out a bunch of glycogen. And so if you measure their blood sugar when they're laying on the floor, it'll be 200, even though a few minutes ago it was 30. It's called a Samoji effect. And what we realized, if you found somebody laying on the floor and measured their blood pressure, it would be high. You know, it wouldn't be low, but that would be a compensatory response. <coughs> And her heart, uh, these people, a lot of times their heart can stop during these events. I'm going to talk more uh, yet tomorrow about, about this phenomenon, about using pacing as a potential therapy in these individuals. Um, and so these would have prolonged periods. And um, I didn't know what I was doing then, not that I really do now. Um, the, uh, so I put her in the hospital, and she was nice enough to pass out wearing a Holter monitor the next day. Um, I love it when people cooperate. Um, <laughs> And you can see that, and by the way, that's not an EKG complex, that's the artifact produced by her striking the floor. Um, but you can see that the episode that she experiences is very similar to what we provoked. And so through these fortu or early fortuitous recordings, we were able to correlate and think, well, we, we, we believe we are provoking what is going on in the outside world. Now with implantable loop monitoring and things like that, what we have realized is these episodes in the outside world are oftentimes much more severe than what we provoke. And let me tell you, nobody does tilt table testing like we initially did it. We let people crash and burn uh, because we wanted to see what was happening. Now, the moment your pressure drops, they put you down, and so you don't really see the whole spectrum. Um, and so, why is that a big deal? Well, you know, as you may, you may not know, you may not know who Will Rogers is. Will Rogers, by the way, uh, John Stewart, when he made The Daily Show, actually based it on Will Rogers' show. Will Rogers had basically the same show as, as uh, John Stewart but in the 1940s uh, on the radio. And actually in John Stewart's biography, he talks about listening to all these. And so it was the same sort of thing, taking the news and sort of making a humorous spin on it. And this is one of his sayings, it's not the fall that hurts, it's that sudden stop at the end. So it's not a problem unless this is somebody related to you. This is a woman after one sinkable event, she, hit the, uh, she was doing dishes, hit the sink, broke her jaw, flipped off there, hit a table. And you can't tell it from this thing, but she, uh, this, if you feel here, it's called the zygomatic arch. And she hit that, it crushed it, and it's called a blowout fracture. It's what um, baseball players sometimes get. So then ophthalmology and ENT spent the next five hours putting her eyeball back together. And unless it's this kid, this is a kid from California with her current syncope. This is after she passed out and went down two flights of concrete stairs and broke both arms in her face. So unless if it's your kid, then it's a problem. Um, we realized then very quickly that not everybody passed out. Many people would drop their pressure and get other symptoms such as lightheadedness, dizziness, cognitive impairment. Uh, we be, and we uh, were starting to use transcranial Doppler to measure cerebral blood flow. It was a new technology at that time. Uh, and we correlated cerebral blood flow measurements with pressures and things like that and can, figured out that as pressure goes down, first you kind of feel tired. If, as your cerebral perfusion goes down and your amount of oxygen getting to your brain goes down, you feel tired at first. And then after that, you kind of feel like you can't think. If it goes down further, you can't think, you can't focus, you can't concentrate. Then more still, you'll start to get lightheaded, dizzy. More still, you'll, you'll see black spots, get tunnel vision, and more still, you'll pass out. Actually, um, in relation to the brain fog, so in January, I spent uh, several weeks in Peru helping construct a school for disadvantaged women, a vocational training center. And it was at 10,000 feet. Um, and at first, man, it was just bad. <laughs> I mean, and I, I had to really focus on what I was doing, because particularly since we were using heavy equipment and stuff, um, because it's like you can't think. I would wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to breathe. And later we went to a place at 13,500 feet. Um, and those low oxygen tensions, you can mimic those kind of things that patients feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we also realized that these episodes, when they were bad, could look like seizures. This is somebody, this is an electroencephalogram of somebody having a real seizure. Um, I've had to learn a lot in the last few years, like how to read EEGs and things I never thought I'd be doing. Um, and this is hypertonic spike in wave activity in the mid-temporal region. This is the tracing of someone who, this is the recording of someone who was a 17-year-old that we caused them to have an episode during tilt table testing and then recorded it on video camera, which is what you do during monitoring. And they looked like they were having a grand mal seizure and as judged by a neurologist. And you, you can see that the EEG, you don't have to be a neurologist to say this looks very, very different. This is diffuse slow wave activity. 
So we began to think, we, and we began to see patterns, and we said there's something here, and the, the symptoms that people are experiencing seem to correlate with the patterns we're seeing. But let me tell you, I've been the director, I've been the co-chairman of two guidelines committees. Any attempt to classify nature and natural phenomena is by its very nature arbitrary. You know, when is it daylight? When is it, when does the day begin? When does the day end? You know, we, we choose a time, you know, what's a normal temperature? You know, what's, uh, what's a normal white count? You just measure a bunch of people and make an average and think that's something good. So you have to realize that the nature of everything we do is when we try to classify nature is arbitrary. Uh, and this is a quote I've liked from Heisenberg. Since the measuring device has been constructed by the observer, we have to remember that what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. So we began to break these down into various categories. I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go into all these in detail. Um, one pattern that we, indeed, what we were looking at at first is a phenomenon referred to as vasovagal or neurocardiogenic syncope, and these individuals, in between their episodes, they're perfectly fine, and then suddenly, out of the blue, their system basically turns off, and their blood pressure and heart rate fall to near zero. Blood pressure usually falls first, heart rate falls second. They hit the ground like a ton of bricks, and if they don't kill themselves, then, then when they wake up, they'll be just fine until their next one. Um, we then began to notice older people, especially those with other neurologic conditions, that when you stood them up, all the blood in their body would just drain down to the lower half of them. Um, and their heart rate would make no attempt in compensation. And these people were sick all the time. They had tons of different things wrong with them that indicated a kind of diffuse failure in the autonomic system. Uh, in the early 1990s, we first became aware of this pattern. This was actually the recording from a, uh, a woman who is a, a ward clerk at our institution who was, had been a triathlete and run in the Ironman triathlon in uh, Hawaii, and she got a bad viral infection and couldn't get out of bed after that. And when we tilted her, you can see that her, blood, her heart rate went from 70 or so to 160, and then her blood pressure dropped, uh, but didn't really bottom out, and then her legs turned sort of blue and then purple and red and things like that, and we looked and said, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so we brought her back the next day, and did, they won't let us do this much now because you get too much radiation, but we gave, we gave her technetium, which is a radioactive tracer. You could see all the red cells, and then we tilted her in front of a gamma camera and found that rough, normally about 15% of your blood volumes in your lower extremities, and her it was somewhere between 35 and 40%. So what you were seeing is blood draining down into the lower half of her, um, and then her heart rate going up as a compensation. So based on that, we went through several systems and we began to classify these disorders into three major groups, both reflex syncopes that are part, vasovagal is part of, postural tachycardia syndrome and autonomic failure. So in postural tachycardia syndrome, we initially became aware of people like this. Uh, and again, as I said, we realized that they were draining blood downward, but we also began to realize that this was not a uniform group, that there were a number of subgroups within it. This is, a, um, this is from Dr. Julian Stewart's lab. I, I borrowed this because it's an elegant picture. And it shows that uh, a young woman who is lying flat, uh, and were, uh, the coloring here is pretty normal. This is called acrocyanosis, indicating peripheral blood pooling when upright. And also there's a, this, actually this is a, a device called a string plethysmogram. And when the um, uh, pooling occurs, the leg actually swells slightly. Um, so that we knew this was going on and we defined this sort of arbitrarily. Um, I personally think that we need to kind of rethink our terminology. We coined this term, actually Phil Lowe at the Mayo Clinic coined it, and we were trying to get validity for the concept and so we set several rigid criteria for it, such as an increase in heart rate of 30 beats a minute a, or an excess of 120 within a certain period of time. But in reality, we did this to prove the point and to be very rigid about research, I think the term has outlived its usefulness because it neglects to mention any of the other factors that these people are experiencing. And again, there's a day-to-day -day variability. If your heart rate goes up 29 beats today, do you not have it? And then tomorrow it goes up 32 beats, do you have it? I mean, it becomes this sort of game. Um, so again, it's like you've got to keep in mind these are relative things and very arbitrary numbers that was uh, drawn up. Um, this term, uh, some people prefer orthostatic intolerance, which really looks at the provo uh, provoking symptoms when upright. This is not new, by the way. Um, the blood pressure cuff, as we know it, was invented during the First World War in 1914. And so by 1919, people could actually, for the first time, measure blood pressures. And Sir Thomas Lewis, widely considered the father of modern cardiology, 
published this paper in 1919. And what astonished me when I first read this is he described people perfectly, absolutely perfectly. So this just didn't drop out of nowhere. This has always been present. We just didn't see it. These are the kind of symptoms that people experience, and you probably know all these already, so I don't have to really go over them. This is the percentage of people that experience them. We also realized that this was not one big happy family, but rather a number of subgroups, and that some people had, some, uh, had an idiopathic form where we didn't know what was hap why it had occurred, but other people, it was occurring as a consequence of some other coexisting illness. So for example, we saw many diabetic patients where the diabetic process had destroyed the nerves connecting the brain and the vasculature. This again, I borrowed from Dr. Julian Stewart. Um, uh, this is a uh, patient, the same patient who you saw previously with a matched control subject, and you can see their heart rate and blood heart rate is much higher and blood pressure much lower. How many people are out there? God herself only knows. Um, uh, the, uh, somewhere between probably half a million and a million or maybe more depending upon how you wish to define it. Uh, these people are very functionally impaired oftentimes. Um, the, I mean, and one of the problems of being in a tertiary referral center is you only see what you're sent and you're sent the worst things. And so you really, it's very hard to get a good grip on what the average person in the community might be like because you just don't see them. Um, but these people can be very impaired and about 25% of them at least are disabled. Now early on, um, probably one of the principal research centers in the whole world for doing this was here in Nashville at Vanderbilt under the direction of Dr. David Robertson who was a visionary researcher. And we realized that there was another group of people within this that although they got very, very tachycardic, they were oftentimes very hypertensive. And they were like mere images of the rest of the POTS patients. So the rest of the POTS patients would become constipated, they would have diarrhea, they'd be cold all the time, these people would be hot. Uh, and their, their serum norepinephrine or adrenaline levels, for those of you from Europe, um, were very, very high. And, and it was like, there's something different about them. And luckily, he got a family where they had several generations of people affected by it, and they were able to map it out and identify a single point mutation that was genetically passed from generation to generation where one letter of the DNA code was off. So every three letters of the DNA code is called a codon. Codes for a different amino acid. Change one letter, get a different amino acid. It's called a point mutation. Happens all the time. All of us have millions of them. But usually it's some out of the way place. It doesn't really matter much and you don't really notice it. Although it may account for the different degrees of reactivity to different drugs that people have. Um, they were able to map this out that it, was a, that it was a single point mutation. And that point mutation cause the substitution, instead of getting a, a compound called, a pro, a amino acid called alanine, you got proline, it was in this protein membrane, and this, mem this protein recycles norepinephrine. And so in a normal nerve, when you release norepinephrine, it goes across here, it stimulates the next nerve, the next nerve then releases a compound called nitric oxide that tells this protein to start sucking this up and recycling it, because it takes it a while to make it. Um, so it sucks it back up and you reuse it, 80% gets sucked back up and 20% spills over. And these individuals, because this doesn't work well, like 25% or 30% or more can spill over into the system. And then what will happen is because you can't recycle it and because it's, you can't keep up with the production lo with the loss with production, then you'll deplete it and then they'll crash. What's that like? That's just like bipolar disorders, except with a different neurotransmitter, dopamine. So the very same mechanism seems to, be, to, uh, to occur with other neurotransmitters in other parts of the nervous system. But the majority of people appeared to be autoimmune in nature very early on because of the fact that people would give a history very, very similar to most autoimmune disorders. Um, the, um, uh, we began to suspect that these were autoimmune in nature. I will give you an example. I, my wife passed away a few years ago and I'm in a new relationship and my girlfriend got a bad cold and then develop full-blown rheumatoid arthritis. Boom. You know, and there is a concept called molecular mimicry that a virus gets into you by looking like you. And then by, because your immune system in going after it goes after whatever part of you it looks like. And that's the term molecular mimicry. So we really began to think that these were uh, possibly true. And Steve Verino, who was at that time at the Mayo Clinic, published a landmark paper in 2000 in the New England Journal where he identified autoantibodies to peripheral acetylcholine receptors. Now it turns out that they are not the majority of people, but it was the first time that people did this. Um, 
Subsequently, there have been a number of papers that have looked at it. This was a, another landmark paper by the group at Oklahoma, by uh, Lee and colleagues, where they identified that many of the patients had, circ they, now they, they looked only at 14 patients, but they found that the majority of them had high circulating levels of autoantibodies to alpha-1 receptors. Alpha-1 receptors mediate vascular constriction. Makes perfect sense. If you, were, if you were going to imagine what an antibody was to, that's what you would imagine. And so there, they very elegantly showed in this very small group of people that uh, this was possible. Now, there's been an explosion in this autoimmune research because previously, back 20 some years ago, it would have cost millions of dollars to do this. With advances in modern technology, it now is still expensive. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, but at least it's within the reach of mere mortals. Um, so this, I, this is the first time I'll be uh, showing this, so you have the privilege of seeing the first of our results. Um, we've, done, uh, we've looked at now 75 patients um, who had very class, now we chose people who had very classic histories, okay? I was perfectly fine, I got this really bad infection, and I've been sick since that day. They'll tell you the day they got sick, okay? So we did this on purpose because we were, this is a proof of concept study. We're not, this is not an absolute indication, but rather we're saying, is there a relationship here that we need to pursue? And um, we started out by doing immunofluorescence techniques, but we really realized that we would spend the state budget of uh, Tennessee on that. So we went back and are redoing it with an ELISA scan, which is a little less expensive. And what we have found among these 75 patients, 92% are positive for alpha-1 receptor antibodies. Zero controls have been. And we're still doing more and more control subjects, but so far zero controls have been. Now, occasionally people, there are other, uh, uh, auto -anti uh, other uh, receptors that we've been looking at, and there are some people that are positive for alpha-2 things, beta-1, beta-2, um, but, uh, and a lot of times people have both and will have more than one thing, but this is the majority of people. Now, um, Dr. Verino has been looking also at muscarinic receptors, and we found that in indeed, uh, mimicking his response, his results rather, uh, we found M4 receptors at high levels, but anybody who had a high muscarinic receptor also had a positive one for uh, alpha-1 receptors. So, so far, 92% of these patients are positive for this. Um, and uh, we think that's a pretty significant number. And we're, again, we're doing more and more control subjects. Um, we'll have an equal number of control subjects soon and we'll send this out for publication. Um, interestingly, we had four patients where every autoantibody was elevated. I mean, everything we tested. Um, so I think there's, this is a diffuse group. This, but when I showed this to the director of rheumatology at our institution, he said, yeah, so. <laughs> um, he said, this is what you see in all the rheumatologic disorders. This is what you see in rheumatoid arthritis, in scleroderma, in, in, in Sjogren's and all this, where these diffuse different antibodies are present. Uh, lupus has 10 different autoantibodies associated with it. 10. I didn't know that, actually, until he told me that. So he said, this is just what you would expect if it was an autoimmune disorder, so don't get too bent in shape about it. Now, again, is this proof? No. However, you know, it is, this is a proof of the concept that this is what we're dealing with. So again, we need to go on and do much more research looking at this, but it opens the potential in the future to treating people with immunosuppressive therapy. However, again, to give you an example, my girlfriend is on Plaquenil, Methotrexate, Humira, and all this stuff. She got a mosquito bite, you know, that didn't seem like much. It itched a little bit, and in two days, she had a cellulitis that had spread across her chest and ended up in the hospital getting IV antibiotics. Um, because you basically give people a chemically induced form of AIDS. In one of my former lives, um, which was another zigzag I took along the way, I was heavily involved in transplant medicine, heart transplant medicine, and uh, people don't reject hearts anymore. You know, we beat that. What kills people are the drugs we use, give them to prevent the rejection. So we're going to approach this with great caution. Um, the um, Researchers at Hopkins, uh, Dr. Peter Rowe in particular, realized that many people had hypermobile uh, traits and suggestive of EDS. I probably have to get rid of this because nobody knows who this character is anymore. <laughs> but for those of you younger folk, it's Gumby. Um, Gumby, by the way, was the first claymation. That's why it was famous. It was the very first claymation that was done. Um, anyway, um, most of you are aware of this. This is a... Um, uh, 
genetic disorder in which you have a more elastic kind of collagen in multiple places throughout the body. Uh, patients have, are hypermobile. Um, we use the rheumatology system, which is, uses uh, a different set of criteria than the other one. And we use this pretty rigidly when we're, when we're diagnosing people, uh, and they have to have a series of criteria. Um, this is a picture of one of our patients from when they were younger. Uh, now, there's been a big argument about cause and effect, about whether or not this really predisposes people, and I actually think it predisposes people. And by the way, I didn't show the slide, but many, it turns out that when we went back through and analyzed our data, a large percentage of the antibody positive people also have hypermobility criteria. Um, this was a study done in Israel where they took uh, 48 people with asymptomatic hypermobility syndrome, met all the criteria, and then did all, uh, compared them to 30 controls and did a um, series of autonomic tests on them. And they found that 78% of them were abnormal. So these people were accidents waiting to happen. So this is how we break things down. I'll very quickly, I realize I'm running out of time, but I'll very quickly just go over some of these and the other groups. Um, autonomic failure was for, is not new. It's been described since the 1920s. They call it idiopathic orthostatic hypotension. Here you get a generalized state of failure of the autonomic system. It's usually in older adults. It's more men than women. Uh, it's usually a very slow and insidious onset. And basically, the entire autonomic system just slowly shuts down. Um, it is not usually lethal, but debilitating. This system, this condition called multiple system atrophy, is both somatic and autonomic. And these people don't do well. They usually die within five years of diagnosis. This is an unfortunate uh, physician who was, at the, uh, who was an ER physician at the University of Michigan. Uh, and these people, you can, in the pure autonomic failures, you don't see brain changes, but these people get brain atrophy. Um, and this is, uh, shows atrophic changes. This was a businessman in our area uh, who also died of this. And the, it's, it's very tragic to look at these people. It's like having ALS. There are several different forms. There's a Parkinsonian form that's frequently misdiagnosed as Parkinson's. Um, and actually an autopsy study done in the United Kingdom showed that many brains of people they thought had Parkinson, Parkinson's disease actually had multiple system atrophy at autopsy. There's also a cerebellar form. I won't go into this a lot. Um, Parkinson's disease can also destroy your autonomic system, at least in a third of the patients. And it turns out that, by the way, Parkinson's disease is not a central nervous system disease. It actually starts probably in the abdominal area and spreads centrally. Because when you do uh, nerve biopsies of people and you look at peripheral nerves, you can find these characteristic inclusion bodies called Lewy bodies that are there. Uh, when it starts in the brain and then spreads outward, it's called Lewy body dementia, which is what Robin Williams had, by the way, which is why he did himself in. Um, where it starts the other way. And, it very, and it very, it's very likely that Parkinson's um, and uh, multiple, uh, Parkinson's and um, pure autonomic failure may be different aspects of the same disorder. There's also an acute autonomic failure I usually see in children. Uh, these people uh, get a viral infection and then the whole system shuts down. Uh, and literally they develop overnight just complete failure of everything. They're so orthostatic they can't even put their heads up. Their bowel shuts down. They frequently have to go on TPN. They get agonizing pain. They frequently get very bradycardic. Um, these people we do treat with immunoglobins or plasmapheresis. You also have to realize that many people can have it due to some other illness. As I said, diabetics, we've seen it as a preliminary to cancer. Multiple sclerosis can, can initially present with autonomic problems. Um, so in any kind of classification, when you're, when you're looking at this stuff, everybody wants to put things in pigeonholes. Uh, but one of my heroes is Stephen Hawking, who said uh, elegantly that the universe is analog, not digital. Uh, and we tend to forget that everything's connected to everything else, and Leonardo da Vinci even realized that. Um, indeed, people overlap. We've seen m multiple people, it's, and this is the kind of Venn diagram that the pulmonary people use to show the interrelationship between asthma, bronchitis, and emphysema. There are also many medicines that can exacerbate this. Uh, so you, again, you, when you're looking at people, you've got to look and see if they're just secondary to things they're taking for something else. So when we see people, they're, you know, the idea is to do a complete history, physical. Uh, there are different autonomic tests that can be done. I'll talk more about implantable monitors tomorrow. Um, you try to eliminate things that, that are making people worse, uh, especially if they're on other drugs that are making them worse. 
Uh, we try to very much to recondition people and build them back up and need reconditioning is one of the major things. Our goal in therapy is to put somebody on a medicine to get them stable enough we can recondition them. This is a quote from Voltaire, which I th was from the novel Candide, which I thought was uh, very elegant. Doctors pour drugs of which they know little and the patients about whom they know less with diseases of which they know nothing. <laughs> Not much changes. There's a whole bunch of meds that we've looked at and I'll just briefly go over them. Um, this was a trial we were part of looking at uh, metoprolol and syncope. Interestingly, the, there enough there may be an age difference because what we found is that uh, younger patients may, were made worse by beta blockers, older patients were made better. Um, mitodrin is an alpha-1 receptor stimulant, which makes sense if you think about what I said about the antibody things. It seems to be an effective agent. There have been a number of studies looking at its use and found it to be effective. In neurocardiogenic syncope, we felt that there was a central nervous system disturbance and possibly a, a reduction in the level of serotonin leading to a hypersensitivity of it um, so that people were hypersensitive to small changes. Um, and we began to use serotonin reuptake inhibitors as a therapy. This was a study that was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology in 1999, which was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial of paroxetine. And it went for two years. Um, and the recurrence rate in the people treated with paroxetine was 17%, and the recurrence rate on placebo was 52, 53%. This drug, protostigmine, accelerates uh, ganglionic transmission of acetylcholine, so it can enhance both sympathetic and parasympathetic function. Um, the Vanderbilt group published the first randomized trial. And again, they've been the world's, one of the world's leaders in this research. But this trial only had 17 patients, and the follow-up was only a couple of months. This was a, uh, from um, uh, Mayo Clinic. They looked at about 20 patients. So we looked at a, a total of 203, and we chose really sick people on purpose. And we followed them all for about a year, and we found it would work in about half, 51%. Uh, erythropoietin was originally brought out to treat anemia, but it's a potent vasoconstrictor. Uh, the idea of using it to treat, since hypertension is the major side effect, the idea of using it as a therapy for hypotension is not new. The first paper was published in 1993 in the New England Journal. And again, we found uh, in a controlled study that we could get a success rate in about 71% of people. So another drug we use is octreotide. Remember I said that the majority, of base, the majority of blood pooling is in the mesenteric vasculature. This constricts the mesenteric vasculature um, and it will work uh, in about 50% of the people who failed everything else. This is a new, this is, in the United States, this is a new drug, Abradine. It slows down heart rate with no effect on blood pressure. It has been available in Europe for 20 years. Uh, it has only recently become available in the U.S. Uh, in one of my, my arguments about the way we do things, uh, the company that sells it here buys generic drugs in Europe, repackages them in U.S. packaging, and sells them for $10 a piece, making a 900% profit per pill. Um, so anyway, um, Using this drug, we showed that it would work in literally 76% of patients, which is, which uh, there have been two European studies published and they have shown about the same thing. So uh, this has been an exceptionally useful drug. Uh, we, many of our patients now obtain it from Canada um, and it's just a problem, you know, it's just like price gouging. Um, and again, this is just a, a reduction in symptom scale. So one of the more controversial things that came out was the idea of using intravenous saline and people were very, very uh, opinionated and yelling at each other and we figured, well, rather than screaming and throwing things at each other, maybe we should actually look at this as scientists. Uh, so we did a study where we looked at this and we found that uh, intermittent intravenous saline infusions would work in 90% of people. Um, now, that's all well and good, and the saline itself is quite safe, but I can tell you as a former, as a cancer survivor, uh, that you quickly destroy everything that looks like a vein in your body when you start getting IVs all the time. Um, and you end up having to put ports in people. Now, in our study, we had a, we had a ironclad rule that the ports could only be accessed by people at certified infusion centers. So in the study, we had almost no problems. However, there, I have seen horrendous infections and problems occur. And in my, own, my late wife had two different ports. The first one eroded through her skin. The second one gave her unending levels of problems. So you're, you're, you're taking on a certain degree of risk when you do this. 
So again, we try to use this only as bailout therapy or when all else fails, we, we will use it. Uh, but again, there's a certain risk involved in doing this. So this is how we approach uh, therapy. Uh, and the regular, the majority of people, the, the people who are uh, peripheral, the partial dysautonomics are what's now called the neurogenic form, that we hydrate them, use volume expanders, vasoconstrictors, et cetera. In the hyperadrenergics, it's kind of the opposite. You have to slow things down, so you use alpha beta blockers like labetalol, clonidine, methyl dopa. Uh, and people that have triggers to these, such as the site of blood, biofeedback is really effective. We published two papers. Um, having been through cancer, having watched my wife die of cancer, uh, now dealing with my daughter's MS, um, the most difficult thing of all this is the emotional part of it. Um, I would like to sit here and say, oh yeah, I was this big he man when I had cancer. Bullshit. I was a mess. Um, I was angry, I was mean, I was bitter, I was hostile, I was resentful. I didn't make anything better. As a matter of fact, I made everything I could worse. Um, and it was only with great reluctance I started seeing one of the psychologists that work within the cancer program. And I was a fool. I should have done it way before. Uh, and we're, I, you know, we're fortunate enough at our institution that we have two psychologists that work with people with chronic illness, but that's very hard to find. And one of the problems, you know, and these, and I saw her for years. The other problem is you bring your past with you to your illness. And some people have a very difficult past, and it all comes back with a vengeance, I can tell you. Um, and unfortunately, in the modern psychology world, there's this idea of cognitive behavioral therapy. You get seen five times, they give you all this stuff, and they pat you on the head and send you on, the, on your way. And it, is, it takes a long time to reframe how the fact that your life is going to be very different now than what it was before. <clears throat> and we try very hard to get people into counseling to sort of, not because we think that they have some psychogenic component to it, but rather how to learn to live with a chronic ailment and how to learn to live with the fact that your life may be very different than what you had in mind. Um, so these things have always been here. They, they didn't pop out of nowhere. You can go back through the literature and find reports of these as far back as you want to look. We just see them now. We can look and see what's happening. Uh, and it's been in what's called a paradigm shift in our way of thinking. And this is one of my favorite poets, T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the very first time. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's been a, I gave a talk uh, at Cleveland Clinic about career options and the title of it, what a, what a long, strange trip it's been. Um, so, um, but each of you can do something. Each of you can help move the field forward. Each of you can help make a difference. And it's only through collective action that things really get done. Single individuals can oftentimes be the initiators and all, but it has to be a group effort to really be able to, to change things. Um, again, one of my uh, heroes is Dr. Hawkins. Um, and, you know, that despite all of the problems that he encountered in his life, you know, probably having one of the worst possible diseases that usually kills people within a few years, he managed to live till 73 or so with it. Um, nonetheless, I mean, you just don't give up, you know, you keep going. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to Dr. Robertson, who's retiring. Uh, Dr. Robertson, who is here at, at uh, Vanderbilt, was one of the leading pioneers, probably the, one of the fathers of autonomic research. Uh, he has been an innovator, researcher, visionary, advocate, uh, and really the whole field owes tremendous amounts to the effort and, and insight and research that he's done. And it's an honor to be in the same place as he is. And I think we give him a Lifetime Achievement Award tonight or, tonight or tomorrow. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here and share this with you. I don't know if I can have time for questions or if we have to move on or what. Okay. Okay. Yeah.
No, we do them. I mean, don't get me wrong. We do them, but with appropriate caution. I mean, you know, when you go through cancer therapy, you're using drugs that could kill you. You know, but you but you do it but you do it with the knowledge that that can happen. You monitor people closely. You, at the very first sign of anything that's wrong, you, you jump on it. And, and having said that, I mean, we get increasing numbers of people sent to us who have already failed everything by the time they walk in the door. Um, so there's very few other options. But, but the idea is I, what I don't want to see is just people doing it willy-nilly without, without appropriate cautions. I mean, I managed thank God, to escape getting a port. Um, I mean, I had the worst phlebitis you could ever imagine on both arms, but I managed to get by without it. Um, the, um, it, it. You have to do it with appropriate cautions. I mean, I can give you an example. I mean, a few, about, no, I guess it's about a year ago, I walked in the clinic and there was a young woman from uh, Kentucky, and I just walked in, took one look at her and said, you're septic. <laughs> You're just septic, you know, I mean, she looked awful. We admitted her to the hospital. She had endocarditis. She had a huge vegetation growing on one of her heart valves. Um, and she was getting home, she had a uh, port that someone had put in. She was getting home IV therapy. She ended up spending a month in the hospital on IV antibiotic therapy. Uh, we, we probably are gonna have to replace her one heart valve um, because, of, because the, we're hoping it, we don't, but my guess is we're going to have to replace her mitral valve, which means she's going to have an artificial valve for the rest of her life. No, <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Um, no, I mean, that's why, as I said, that you, sometimes you have to do things that carry with them a risk, but everybody must go into that process knowing it's a risk. That's why I haven't jumped into the idea of using immunosuppressive therapy, you know, because you're playing with fire. You know, you, I mean, all of the things I mentioned that we normally use, wrapped up together and multiplied times two, doesn't begin to have the risk and side effects of any, of any um, immunosuppressive drug. You know, pla I mean, I saw someone in clinic who received Plaquenil for rheumatoid arthritis who's blind because of it. The principal side effect of Plaquenil is blindness. Um, the, um, you know, methotrexate can shut down your immune system and ruin your liver. Uh, I mean, the um, um, Humira and drugs like that are associated with a dramatic increased risk of a lymphoma. You know, I mean, so you're playing with big time side effects and you've got to be really, really sure you're doing the right thing. And yes, it, when somebody's really sick and everybody's on board, we will take those risks. But, but with the appropriate cautions and following people like a hawk. Dr. Oh. Yeah, strokes, well, strokes within the, within the, within the hypothalamic or thalamic tract will destroy your autoregulation. I'm being told I have to stop. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, no, but there is a correlation with people with migraines, and many of them have migraines. Okay, 20% of all strokes are due to migraines. So, thank you.